Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Prime Talk. Today, I have a special guest. Today, I'm having Lisa Kinski. Lisa is the marketing assistant at Noviland, which is an end-to-end supply chain solution for e-commerce sellers. So, uh, Lisa, welcome to the show. Hi, Yoni. Thanks for having me. It's it's so weird being on the other side of it now as a guest. I don't have anything to do. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for having me at the show a few weeks ago. It was a really a delightful event, you and uh, uh, Francois. Um, but today is really going to be all about you. It's going to be uh, the episode of uh, Lisa Kinski. You're going to share with us, who are you? What are you? Where are you from? Where'd you grow up? How'd you uh, begin your professional career all the way uh, to where you are today with e-commerce? So I guess without further ado, let's jump right into it. Sure. So um, I am a Georgia girl born and raised, uh, born in Woodstock, Georgia, which is just north of the kind of like metro Atlanta area. Um, My parents are originally from Ohio, but they moved down here in, I want to say 1980. And then, um, of course, that's just where they planted their roots and it's where I've been ever since. So, um, And the reason for the move was what, a job opportunity or just uh, the cold was too much already or? So my mom left because it was too cold. Um, but my dad's dad started a business down here. And I think my dad came down to help my grandpa with that. And my mom, the way what my was the business, uh, they owned a liquor store actually. Yeah. It was a liquor store. Is it regulated by the state over there? I, I lived in uh, North Carolina back in the day and uh, you can only get like alcohol or liquor in like these stores where you get a, a license from the government. I think it's even operated, but I think it's called ABC stores. I think which, which means for alcohol uh bottled tobacco anyways that i don't want to oh atb maybe alcohol tobacco uh ats alcohol tobacco stores or something like that never maybe. mind i, I don't yeah. think that it's the same here because like i know in pennsylvania it's very strict like all government run and you can't like i don't know you like you can get like beer at walmart but like you have to get liquor from like a state-owned it. store. it's not the same here you can yeah every state has its own store yeah, yeah. Got it. yeah. um but I think they moved down here to um, help with the liquor store. But the way my dad tells the story is that he didn't ask mom to come with him. She just said, I'm getting in the car. Um, <laughs> but they've been here ever since. So yeah, born and raised in Woodstock. That's where we went to high school. Um, went to Kennesaw State, got a degree in management, graduated in December of 16. And, you know, did you, I did three four years of college, four and a half, <laughs> four and a half. All right. That's good. Yeah, I took, um, you know, finance and accounting weren't my strong suit. I had to redo a couple of those, but also I did a study abroad while I was in college too. So I got some credits that didn't actually go to my degree, but where'd you go abroad? Italy. Which part? So it's in the Tuscan region. We spent two weeks in Montepulciano and then a couple of days in Florence and a couple of days in Rome with a day trip to Siena and a day trip to Pienza, which is really exciting because my dad's side of the family is originally from Florence. So it was like going back to visit where the family originally came from, which was super cool. That's nice. Tuscany is in the South, right? If I'm not mistaken. <sighs> kind of. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a boot. Yeah. Italy looks like a boot. Yeah, it's not like at the bottom of the boot or anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, no, I know there's an island, Sicily. That's an island. It's not really connected to the boot uh, physically. Got it. But uh, growing up, did you do anything um, out of the ordinary and involved entrepreneurship or special activities uh, during uh, junior high, high school? Anything uh, music, anything in uh, mm-hmm. culture, community? No, not necessarily. I mean, when I was in middle school, I did chorus. Um, maybe a few years before that, even, I don't really remember, but my parents are entrepreneurs. So my parents owned a heating and air company my whole time growing up. And then, um, my dad owned a hot tub company for a little while too. And mom has always helped out with, you know, they, they just did the businesses together. So like for the HVAC dad would go do the service calls and everything. And mom would help take care of the bookkeeping and kind of the behind the scenes stuff. So I was raised by really hardworking entrepreneur, you know, entrepreneurs, and that kind of instilled a lot of my work ethic. So, you know, the dream was kind of to always take over the HVAC company, which I knew nothing about. It was just you you taking over the HVAC company. That was uh, the talk in the house. Yeah. Well, that was my idea. And then (laughs) (laughs) how romantic. Yeah. But uh, hold on. So when you grew up, you had to kind of help them in the office or go to do repairs. What was the dynamic? uh... No, I didn't have to. I, I would go sometimes to the office with my mom. Um, which wasn't very far from the house. And I wouldn't go super, super frequently, just sometimes. But when I would, I would like want to answer the phones and I would like want to, you know, take down the messages or whatever. And, and she would let me, she was so sweet, even though I, she knew I couldn't help anybody. It was just like, let me go. But you were comfortable with it, even though you come, maybe even botched it, you were comfortable with it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it was, uh, you know, that was kind of always the dream. I was raised, 
I say this raised as an only child. I have a half brother who lives in Ohio. Um, so I was like the only kid in the house. So I think that I got lucky in that I didn't really have like one person that I could attach to and kind of stay quiet. I was always really outgoing kid. I was always out hanging out with my friends and I was just a social butterfly. So I think that helps a lot with, you know, having to, you know, speaking to people and things like that. And then later on, when I got into sales, it was definitely super, super helpful. Got yeah, So let's, I think let's touch about 2012. That's when you graduated out of high school and you wanted to go to university, right? So where'd you go? And uh, what was the decision? Meaning what did you start learning? I understand that you had a pivot in the middle. Uh, so what was the dynamic there? So I did graduate from high school in 2012 and I actually didn't want to go to college. I went kind of just because it seemed like the smarter decision, you know, you can't really do much anymore without having a piece of paper in your hand. So what do you want to do instead of going to college? That's, uh, that's a little bit unusual, right? Because I guess the, the, today the, the paradigm is uh, college, right? Everybody wants to go to college. So what was in your mind? In those yeah. moments? I don't think I had a plan. I, I think I just decided I was going to figure it out, whatever. I really don't remember that I had any kind of plan at all. I just decided that I was going to work and just kind of make it happen. I don't know. So just grow up overnight after college. You're on your own. You're an adult in a free <laughs> world and boom, rocket. So what pushed you into a uh, university eventually? Uh, probably ultimately my dad, he, you know, kind of pushed me and saying, you know, you don't have to go to school if you don't want to, but it's definitely going to be the better decision for you. And, you know, obviously every kid wants to make their parents happy. So, um, went to Kennesaw state. I stayed there for all four and a half years and, I didn't have, you know, cause I didn't really want to go to school. I didn't have a major specifically that I wanted to do. I didn't have any big interest in, you know, like I said, I had to retake finance. So that wasn't my forte. I didn't want to go for like chemistry or exercise phys or anything like that. So, um, I just got a run of the mill management business degree. Cause you can, what did you actually enjoy or studying, learning or university or anything you would discover you kind of actually f feel like you belong there or you, you like. I, I enjoy psychology a lot, but there's more like kind of the medical side to it that I uh, is not my forte. I can't, I've got white coat syndrome like crazy. So, um, but I like the psychology part of it. I like learning about, you know, specifically like mental illness, like schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, you know, um, like multiple personality, things like that. That always interests me. The stuff that's covered in like criminal minds, you know, but <laughs> Yeah, stuff like, you know, it's, it's uh, always good to do like a Hollywood show or a movie about right? all these uh, uh, paranormal things. But um, all right, so 2016, uh, but by the way, the four and a half years you were studying, you went away or it was you stayed at home? What was the, what yeah. were you living? Yeah, I stayed at home. Um, I was very blessed. My parents let me live at home rent free. I did work crazy, crazy hours, um, you know, to help pay for school and things like that. But I lived in Woodstock and just commuted to Kennesaw, which isn't super far. The traffic's crazy, but, um, not super, super far. So I was able to, you know, actually graduate from school debt-free because my parents were gracious enough to let me live at home. That's great. That's great. And this is a state, local, uh, private college. Well, Kennesaw. Uh, it's a public university here in Georgia. It's actually the second or third largest university in terms of student body, second only to either UGA or Georgia Tech. Um, I can never remember the ranking. <laughs> got it, got it. It's all good. Sounds good. Uh, and a small question on the sidelines. Uh, how many people will always get confused? Uh, you know, Woodstock, Georgia, Woodstock, New York, where they had the big uh, festival in the 60s. Uh, that's kind of the story of your life. It's trailing you. All the time. Yeah. <laughs> actually asked me that like two weeks ago. He was like, you keep saying Woodstock. Is it the Woodstock? I was like, no, honey, that was in New York. <laughs> yeah. So a uh, small history uh, over here. So yeah, back in 1969, I think, or 67. Yeah. Uh, late sixties, um, massive event in upstate New York, uh, Woodstock, New York. It was a dairy farm, but this nice gentleman, they, they kind of uh, scrambled together at this big show. It became a ballistic uh, success because we had the legends like uh, Jimi Hendrix, Led Zeppelin, Rolling Stones, you name it. There were there Beatles even, I might be wrong. But uh, it was a massive, massive thing, historical, and uh, people were splashing in the mud. Everybody kind of knows uh, the Woodstock story. But uh, we we're talking about here, Woodstock, Georgia, uh, you know, the vicinity of Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, different world, different vibes, and um, this is taking us to that uh, vibe of the world. So, all right, 2016, you graduate, and what was the dynamic for you? What was the, uh, you were in a junction probably, so what did you do? Yeah. Graduating in December of 16, I actually had very different plans. Um, I was in a relationship at the time that would have led me to move across the country and that actually did not come to fruition. So I was about three weeks from graduation with 
plans to move to Washington. And I was like, I don't have a job. I don't have anywhere to go. So Washington DC or Washington state state. So Once again, you're picking up all these names that have a, multiple locations in the state. So you got to stay, uh, <laughs> Washington state, which is very different climate and a whole different world for me. Um, uh, but that didn't, you know, silver lining, uh, it, everything works out in the end. It's best that I didn't go, but, um, so that was my plan. So anyway, I'm about three weeks from graduation and my plans totally change. And so I texted a good friend of mine and I said, Hey, like we're about to graduate. I've got to move out of my parents' house. Like I've got to figure something out. Do you need a roommate? And she said, well, no, I have two cats and you're allergic to cats. And it's also a one bed apartment. I can't help you there, but do you want a job? So I was like, yes, yes. I need a job. I'm, I'm that's, that's cool. I, yeah. I need a real job. So, um, not that bartending is not a real job, just the sleep schedule is terrible. Um, mm -hmm. so I interviewed at, uh, at my employer that I was with up until the coronavirus layoffs all happened. It's called SJV data solutions, formerly SJV and associates. It's a criminal background screening firm. And I started with them, uh, on December 27th of 2016. And I was there up until March of 2020. And so that's where I got to experience a lot of different things. I worked in their customer service uh, originally. I got to do some. Hold on, what's, what's the mission again and the purpose of this company? Just take us there for a moment. Sure. So SJV Data Solutions is a background screening company. So they do pre-employment and um, tenant screening. So if you ever go to get a job and they want to run your criminal history, um, whenever you do education verifications or employment verifications, if you are in the medical field and your employer needs to confirm the legitimacy of your medical license, SJV kind of takes care of that on the back end. There is a middleman called a consumer reporting agency or a CRA. And they're the ones who it's kind of complicated. There's multiple layers, but you apply for a job, depending on your state, the type of employment, the company, and those specific laws determines what you're able to return and make a hiring decision off of. And SJV's job was to just go grab all of the records that we could find and then provide it back to the CRA to then, you know, filter through essentially and determine, okay, what can we make a decision on, you know, this, that, or the third. So, so basically the, the purpose and the mission of the organization is to uh, help other companies make a smart decision. If that person has a clean history, no, no issues with the records in terms of uh, legality or legal things or issues, and then they can really uh, go back and negotiate or do whatever they want to do um, in terms of employment. That's kind of the mission and purpose. Exactly. Yeah. Got it. But uh, what was your mission or what was your role in the company? Uh, you know, where'd you start? Where'd you finish? What was the experience like? Yeah. So started as just a regular customer service representative, um, worked up to be an account manager, which is, you know, a CSR customer service representative with more designated larger accounts, um, then worked a hybrid position between sales and customer service for a while. And then I was in sales full time. And then so how do you sell this? When you do say sales, it seems like almost like a you know, it's, a, it's very needed, right? This, this solution is needed. So how do you uh, attract clients or business? What's the competition like? What's the landscape? Yeah, that's a great question. So background screens, is specifically in certain areas, are highly commoditized, right? It's And right. a lot of times it's just a race to the bottom as far as price is concerned. A lot of these counties, especially, you know, in the higher populated areas, everything is able to be automated through the court computer systems and everything is online. So a lot of these companies are building what they call robots. Um, they're just automation systems to grab the information from the website automatically and then send it straight through. So they're very fast um, and they're very accurate as well. So the industry in itself is still relatively new. Uh, the guys who started the companies that are, you know, so like SJV, for instance, it's named after the owner, Scott Vanek. He started the company in his garage in 1998 in Chicago when he was actually a police officer and then moved to Atlanta in 2000. Mm -hmm. And he still runs the company. As far as I know, I haven't seen any, any news of anything different, but he still runs the company. And the same is true for a lot of the guys who started the businesses that are competitors of SJV today. So it's still a relatively new industry. So um, you guys, I mean, SJV was uh, national, is national or regional for the most part? So they have offices in Kennesaw. And then um, I, I don't know, they also had a call center for the verifications department that used to be based in Phoenix, Arizona. I'm mm -hmm. not sure if that's still the case. Um, but we had employees all over the U S um, about 500 employees that just did court research. Cause some of the courts you have to go in and use their computers. A lot of like more rural places, like in South Georgia, you actually still have to go through and flip through the docket books to get wow. information. So we had folks 
all over the U.S. doing that stuff. Um, but we did. I didn't realize it's so granular because it's dependent on so many uh, courthouses and, and uh, local uh, records. Mm-hmm. So it's it's nothing is digitalized, and you have to go there and flip a paper and maybe take a snapshot of it and uh, see what see what's going on with the data. Yeah, some of them you have to do that. Others you just have to go in and log into the computer system that the court has there. They just don't make it available online. So it's still, um, you know, about there's a good portion of the searches that still take a physical visit to the courthouse. Got it. But tell me, the, the clients were mostly uh, uh, Fortune 500 companies or small businesses or both, or what was the mix? So with SJV's position, we worked exclusively with consumer reporting agencies. We didn't work with end users, which would be the hiring company. So like when, you know, Noviland hired me, they would go through a consumer reporting agency to gather all of my information. So especially if you're like higher up in a financial firm, they want your um, your civil records, your credit records, things like that. So they'll go to a consumer reporting agency who then farms out the actual legwork to companies like SJV. So we'd work exclusively. So SJV is more like a supplier. It doesn't do uh, B2C, it does B2B. Uh, okay. And mostly on a wholesale level where it's a few bo- large bodies that they need a, a, a wholesale amount of data and information constantly. Yeah. 100%. Mm-hmm. Got it. Yeah, I was on the impression that, you know, I'm a regular folk. I have a, maybe a liquor store like your, your, your grandparents and I want to hire somebody. I just reach out to SJV. And Stan, that's not the case. They go to all these other bodies and these bodies utilize SJV in the back end to get yeah. what they need. You're exactly right. Yes. Got it. All right. So um, interesting. I, uh, I'm not too familiar with this industry and it's, uh, it's nice to get an insight of uh, the dynamic, how it all works. So it's pretty cool. It is. <laughs> it's not It's not something that anybody talks about, but... Um... Yeah, this is the belly of America. I'm not sure in other countries really how it works. The ability to get you know records on... Uh, you know, potential em- em- employees and stuff like that. It's, I think it's, it's a modern system that America keeps, uh, or in the United States keeps on perfecting, I think. Yeah, it is. I mean, because we used to conduct international searches as well. We didn't have teams across the world, but we had partners. And there's a lot of countries that really don't keep criminal records. And- I'll give you an example from my country. You know, in my country is so small, and I was born in Israel, just uh, for, for context reasons. So and it's just like almost everybody knows everybody. So somebody comes to an interview, it's like you give a call to your friend, oh, you know this guy? Oh, and you know this lady? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's all good. Mm-hmm. And then it's like almost clannish. Uh, but here, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a big country, 300 million plus people. You have to have uh, standardized systems and, and the ability to really uh, see what's going on. Yeah, you do. And and for that, for that example, exactly that you just gave of like, hey, do you know this guy? Oh, yeah, I do. There's so many folks who just try to put like their best friend down as their manager, you know, when at whatever job they worked. And it's like, no, I need to confirm that like you really work there. So there's a lot more that goes into it. Right. And the privacy laws abroad are very different as well. Like I remember if you wanted to get and I'm, I hope anybody from SJB is listening, I'm going to butcher this. But I, I remember in Germany specifically, you had to have written authorization from the applicant themselves to even submit a records request. And then they had to review the results of the records request and sign off on that before we could even return it to the consumer reporting agency. So these would take months to get done because you had to submit through the verifying body in Germany and everything was done by mail. I mean, they would take absolutely forever. And then it was a different story if the applicant lived in Germany as opposed to in the US. So it's there's a lot of intricacies that go into it. So it sounds like you guys were doing a global work. So besides Germany, which other countries did you guys uh, get involved with? All of them. All of them. Wow. As like, you know, uh, we couldn't get records out of North Korea for, you know, obvious reasons. Um, And then I think there were some laws in China where we weren't able to do searches. I mean, there was a very, very short list where their privacy laws just didn't allow for us to do searches, which was true of all of the reporting bodies, like no background. So you, you used to go internationally by default or that was more of a specific request of, of the CRA body? You had to ask for it. Yeah. So a lot of the searches. It's an add-on. Basically, it's an add-on. I'm sorry? It's an add-on as a solution. You say we could do it nationally or internationally, right? It's like an add-on for whoever is requesting. Searches entirely. So you would either run a domestic, either like a, a statewide search, a county search, a national search, or you could order an international for the specific country. And then if you knew that this person lived in multiple countries, you had to have individual searches for each of those countries because the processes are different. Wow. Interesting layering. I didn't realize that. Very, very cool. All right. So 2020, right? March, uh, you know, big, uh, big month for the world. Uh, global pandemic hits in COVID-19. Uh, what was your story? Uh, I was already working from home for a while. So I was on the, um, marketing team at that point in time, it was just me and another gentleman, Nick Fishman. He's incredible. Um, he lived in, uh, oh gosh, I forget now Chicago. I want to say, 
Um, anyway, I was already working remote. So when they were like, and nobody's coming into the office, everybody's remote. I'm like, well, this doesn't affect me at all. We're all good. Um, well then once all the courthouses closed down, of course, there's no, nobody's hiring because nobody's going into work and all the courthouses are closed. So there's no records to be processed. So, um, I was laid off in March along with about 40% of the workforce. And from there, it was just start applying to other places because at that point we didn't know when, you know, the SJV business was going to be coming back. They ran with a really lean team and I think they've brought most everybody back, which is, you know, good for them. They seem to be doing well. Um, but it was just start applying the next day, just started putting in applications after application. And, you know, along with everybody else in <laughs> the U S wow. so, yeah. 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 That's a rough moment. So in March, everything comes to a standstill, especially for your organization, your business, uh, complete freeze. Um, yeah, you didn't like slack back and say, let me take unemployment. You were next day, you already applied. And I think those first few weeks, that's when uh, unemployment just soared. It was just, it's, it was like a bungee jump in reverse. It was all jumping up the, the, you know, tens of millions of people just applying for new jobs overnight. It yeah. was kind of a uh, devastating on, on a, on a fiscal level. Um, okay. So you're in that mix and what happened? Well, did you get lucky or it was a little <laughs> bit of a, Got very lucky, but it took a couple of months. Um, and you know, as, as my dad said, I, I sat in the catbird seat pretty much the whole time because I got laid off in March when, you know, and, and my income at that point in time allowed for me to get the full amount with the unemployment. I was living off of the unemployment, but it's, that didn't mean I wasn't looking for work. I absolutely was. Um, but I w- was getting that. And then with the additional, you know, uh, stimulus that we were all receiving on unemployment weekly. So, um, I was receiving that and I was looking for a job and I finally, I interviewed at Novi land on July 1st, I want to say. And then I started on July 13th and that additional 600, everybody was getting with their unemployment checks was going to be running out at the end of July. So I really like was able to take advantage of, you know, all the way to the finish line. Yeah. 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 Right up until the end. So, um, I got, I got very lucky finding this at Novi land. And it's funny because, you know, folks are like, well, what, what made you go to Novi land? You know, we, we just hired on a new guy, Jack, he's incredible. And, you know, I spoke with him before he was hired on. He was like, you know, why did you choose Novi land? I was like, Shug, I'll be honest with you. I applied to over 200 places between March and June, you know, July. I don't remember submitting this application. I was just looking for a job. Like, will this cover my bills? Do I have the skills for this? fantastic. I don't mind commuting. Like, (laughs) let's just go. I need a job, but it's not what got me here. It's what keeps me here. And, and I'm very, very happy to be at Novi land. I'll be here. Um, like I said, a year in July and they're just an incredible team and and I, you know, really believe in the business, but, but yes, when I was starting, it was, you know, Francois was like, what do you know about supply chain? I was like, nothing, but I will. (laughs) (laughs) All right, cool. Very cool. So yeah, uh, your friend just took my question away. Like what brought you, uh, how'd you get to Novi land? So I guess, yeah, it was a a numbers game and uh, you submitted a bunch of applications and, and that clicked and hit. Uh, but take us to the moments where uh, they explain to you what it is, what's their mission, what's their purpose, and how it began to resonate with you and really um, take form where you know this is your professional career right now. Yeah. So, you know, Novi Land, like you had said before, it's an end-to-end solution for supply chain management and specifically for anybody looking to source products overseas, but we help a lot of e-commerce sellers. And when Francois was kind of explaining everything to me, you know, he, he started here when he was in college. Did he hire you? Yes, he did. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. <laughs> we work very closely together. Um, so, which was also really cool. A lot of times the person that you interview with isn't the person that you work with. So sure. that was, that was also a unique experience. And that was a, a different discussion that we had to have. He and I was, um, you know, working for a startup as opposed to a larger company. The, the company I worked for when I was in college was, you know, Brunswick, which got bought out by Bullmar AMF, but they have all the bowling alleys around the States. And I worked for them for four years. And then I worked for, you know, SJV, which was still considered small to medium sized business, you know, but they weren't a startup by any means. And he was like, this is going to be very different. This is a very, you know, tight, close knit team. You know, things are done a little differently here. Like you can definitely help bring some of the corporate mentality, but there's going to be a lot that's different. And I'm like, Hey man, I'm, I'm totally good with that, you know, and it's been so great. But so I interviewed with Francois, he hired me on, we work together every day. Um, but ha- as he's explaining to me what we do, I, the only mindset that I know to come to it with is the consumer mindset, right? So he started as an intern when he was in college and this is essentially 
I, I don't want to say all that he's known, but you know, he didn't really have like a set career beforehand. He went to school for industrial engineering and I come to it from like the mindset of like an Amazon, like purchaser. So he's like, you know, this, that, and the other happens. I'm like, oh, I just, I just thought like Amazon owned the product and I just, they just like had a warehouse down the street, which is how it got to me so quickly. Like you don't actually think about everything that goes on in the back end. Like the majority of, well, I won't, I wouldn't say the majority, but there's, you know, everybody in this industry knows Amazon doesn't own all of those products. It's, it's Amazon business owners, you know, the e-commerce business owners that sell through Amazon and all the different platforms. Yeah. I think more than two thirds of Amazon sales are from third party sellers, uh, which means Amazon's only owning a third of what's going on in their, their own marketplace, which is phenomenal because when it started, of course, they had 99.9% uh, of, of the retail of volume, but the third party sellers are so robust and they grow so fast and they're so creative and they can explode with um, competitiveness, but also variety, which Amazon wants. That's what's winning. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, so he's explaining all of that to me and it's, you know, it took a little while to wrap my head around and I still feel like there's new things that I'm learning every day, especially once you talk about, you know, expanding into these different marketplaces, like, you know, Walmart, Magento, big commerce, things like that. Um, but then on the supply chain side of everything too, there's, and everything in this industry is in acronyms and I, and I don't understand why. And it's always like <laughs> letters. Um, but you know, when you talk about like the Inco terms and I, Gosh, just the nuances of selling on Amazon altogether. I don't know. It makes sense that there's so many different services for it because no one person can know absolutely everything about it and be an expert because one, they're always changing the game, right? And two, there's just too much. <laughs> Got it. So Noviland, what does it actually do? If Let's say I'm an Amazon seller. I reach out to you guys. What's the pitch? What's the mission? How does it really work? What's the secret? What's the juice? What's the sauce? And why should sellers jump on it? Yeah, so... Noviland is able to help you build and grow your e-commerce business. So we help source from a network of over 4,000 factories overseas, specifically in China. And then we handle the sourcing, the quality control inspections, you know, we'll do, we'll sell out your, um, ship out your samples to you. We handle the shipping and logistics. We also have three PLs here in the U S so we offer the full stack of solutions from start to finish. And it's all managed through a proprietary platform that was built out by our it team. So it's a one-stop shop literally to run your e-commerce business. So when I come in, it's not just, I'm getting phone calls or emails. I'm, I'm actually logging to a, some sort of a dashboard where I give visibility of the whole process of how my products are being sourced overseas. Yeah, absolutely. So you can review your quality reports from there. You can submit RFQs, which are requests for quote, and we'll send, you know, and you're always working with a Noviland team member. You're not having to juggle WeChat and WhatsApp and your email and text messages and staying up until God knows when to get on the phone with somebody from China. So you're always working with a Noviland team member who is then managing those communications for you. And they say, okay, here's your RFQ. We're going to put these out to the factories that we know handle this type of product or this type of material, and then come back to you with, you know, your proposals. And we're going to make the decision there for whatever's best for your business. And from there, you can submit your orders, submit reorders, um, ask for samples, adjustments to samples, and then track your shipments, things like that. So it's like all the way to Amazon's fulfillment center, because if the, the ambition is to obviously source your product, but have it, uh, uh, pinpointed all the way into Amazon's fulfillment center, ready, ready to be sold to the consumer. Is that kind of the dynamic also? So we handle the shipping and logistics and offer um, FBA prep within our three PLs. Of course, we can ship over to your FBA fulfillment center for sure, like just straight from the boat or, or I guess from the cargo ship would be the better way to put it, but we can ship it straight from there or we can be kind of like the filler into your FBA too. So especially with, and I know that this recently changed, it used to be 200 per ASIN and now there's the product type cap, which is fluid apparently based off of the account, but Every, you're still going to need a feeder, right? Especially if you have tons and tons of product that you're selling, you want to have enough inventory domestically, wherever that, you know, be that you're selling so that you're not waiting on product to come over on the ship to, you know, just barely refill your inventory in time. So your IPI doesn't drop. Um, and especially if something like the Suez Canal happens again, I mean, my God, like that's crippling for business. What was it called? The Ever or something? The Everglade or something? Ever Given. Was Ever Given. Episode, but it was... Uh, but it's owned by the company, I think called Evergreen. Um, and yeah, they're. That affected you guys? That affected Noviland? Oh, it affected everybody. I think it affected everyone. I mean, that and then the ports being backed up in, in Long Beach and in uh, Los Angeles with 
one, just not enough employees. And then two, they had that huge COVID outbreak. So there was just a huge backlog, but effective, it affected everybody. <laughs> right, so you have to recalculate the routes or, or the timings of, of uh, deliveries and stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, gotcha. So um, what kind of sellers you typically, okay, before that, actually, I actually connect to what you said, where it's not just all about from the boat into the fulfillment center where you, can, where you guys or Novi Line can do is you basically uh, import it to the United States. You can store it in, in a facility and then drip it into FBA. So you're not so reliant on the global cargo shipping, uh, you know, all that, uh, you know, volatile effect. So if you have enough cash, you can buy in bulk a supply instead of uh, 30 days or 90 days, you buy it maybe for six months or maybe even over a year because you have a solid business and then you can avoid all the noise in between the oceans, right? Because it's, it's a lot of um, pressure going on. Plus there's inflation going on. You know, the price of, of, of moving things around the world is uh, becoming more and more expensive. So you can buy in bulk, you take the attic once, you have it uh, uh, stored here domestically in the United States and then you drip it in. That's kind of the, the magic here. Yeah, exactly. I mean, but the real magic of what Novi Land does is just being able to manage absolutely every single step through the platform that we've created and you don't have to jump around. But what, what about the self-fulfilled, uh, I mean, once you have it stored in the, uh, in a, let's say, uh, a warehouse in the United States, you can drip it into FBA, but you also have capabilities of doing what they call FBM, fulfilled by merchant? Yeah. Yeah, we do FBA and FBM. That's great. I like it because I, I, I've, been, I, I've actually participated with a few forums um, of sellers that are struggling because of the whole um, uh, change of, uh, of uh, quantities in uh, the ASIN level, you know, from 200 to, uh, to the ASIN level and the account level and all these uh, tiers, like you mentioned, the fluid. So they're really, really struggling saying, how am I going to win this? You know, mm. you know, sourcing from China or overseas into the United States, it's painful. The pricing is, 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 is going up, you know, it's skyrocketing. Uh, it's everything's last minute. But I can't, even if I wanted to bombard Amazon FBA's fulfillment center, I can't because all these limitations. So what do I do? I can't, you know, I need, when you source, you want to have basically purchasing power. So if you start making your order smaller and smaller per unit cost, you're losing, I mean, you're losing your margins, right? It's going to be more expensive. If you buy more and more in bulk, your, your margins actually improve. So it puts a seller, a lot of many sellers in a position where they're being squeezed out. Right? They, they, they can't buy too much because Amazon cannot hold too much because they don't have that in-between warehouse in the United States where you can take it in and then safely drip it in or even do self-fulfilled to back it up because you can send to FBA and then uh, by the time you drip it in, you might even sell out. So having that FBM or fulfilled by merchant option is great. So you keep the, sp the wheels spinning. So you, you, know, you never lose uh, traction, you never lose demand because you're always selling because the moment you don't have an inventory, boom, your ranks start to drop. And uh, it's, uh, it's very painful for the sellers because you lose momentum or rank. Um, so I think that's very, very important to sell us to acknowledge that there's a viable solution with Noviland to have that drip ability uh, and, and with the combination of FBM for Philbar Merchant. I think in these days and the, the current momentum, and that's kind of uh, powerful, you should probably stress it out as you go along. But um, okay, so what do we have next uh, for, for Noviland? So uh, the next question for me that I have is, what's the typical uh, 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 size or uh, life cycle of a sellers that you guys work with, especially in the Amazon space? Is it is new sellers, newbies or more established, more uh, enterprise level. What's, what's the dynamic there? Yeah. So, you know, Francois does all of the onboarding calls with each of our users. So if you guys do sign up and even if you just want to have an exploratory conversation to see if we're a good fit for you, definitely, you know, reach out. Everybody can send me a DM or reach out to Francois and we'll get you hooked up. But, um, for an answer of, you know, who like brand new, super fresh sellers aren't necessarily the best fit for us to start out with. Generally, somebody who's already placed a few orders or is already sourcing a few products, really our um, strength is in helping you kind of streamline those services that you already have. But with the factories that we work with and the MOQs that exist and kind of the where our buying power comes in um, is with those sellers that have maybe a little more capital behind them. So somebody who's kind of already been doing it for a little while, but just wants to really scale their business is is the best kind of fit. Yeah, yeah, I think it makes sense because after this experience, all the types of pain points that are out there with with sourcing, and there's uh, you know, this gets complicated very very quickly. And if if then you hit a wall, it can be detrimental to your business. So having a reliable uh, partner, you know, like Noviland, that it's able to do it perfect every time, and even if it doesn't go perfect, you take care of it. You you do all the firefighting or whatever is needed to behind the scenes they don't even realize so you know you have something that you know some somebody that's there is clutching and making it happen and that's scalable it's reassuring so they can focus on many other things that are needed uh, for, for e-commerce business and especially selling on amazon 
Yeah, exactly. And, and being able to just kind of outsource all of your services to a trusted partner, like you said, helps you to work as the e-commerce business owner helps you to work on your business instead of in your business. Like, especially if you're wanting to scale, you don't want to be managing those WhatsApp, those WeChat, those, all those different messages with your freight forwarder over here. And then your quality team over here. And it just, it gets to be too much. Like that's, that's cool. And that's fun. And I think I personally think that it's important to understand every step and every facet of your business as an owner, because otherwise, how can you train folks to kind of help you out? But at a certain point in time, if you want to scale, that's not sustainable. So being able to have a partner who has those solid relationships and processes and systems in place is really vital to being able to help you scale. Yeah, I think also what happens is because they experience so much pain and, and now you relieve the pain, they immediately understand and appreciate the value. So that makes a long lasting partnership. A hundred percent. Yeah. I got you. All right. So, um, so what's, uh, what's the mission for you guys right now? So looking into the future, a year, three years, five years, where do you and Noviland want to be? Uh, and then, well, then I also want to touch a little bit. I know that you, you do have, um, you're an entrepreneur. So you do have uh, also another um, venue that you work on. So you can share with us a little bit about that so we can, can uh, better understand your spirit and your hustle, right? Sure. Yeah. So as far as where uh, we want to be in a few years, I, we have some really exciting projects coming up that I can't talk about. But just know that, um, just be look, just be on the lookout. Probably in the next like couple of months, we're gonna have some really exciting stuff coming out. So I can't really talk about it. But I know that the plan is definitely to continue to grow the Novi Lane business and to grow the Novi Lane team. We just new, moved into this new office. We have so much more space. And uh, where I personally would like to be is I would no longer like to be an assistant. I would love to have a team under me and either be you know manager or director at some point in time. France, while I'm looking at you. Uh, <laughs> But, um, but that's, that's kind of the goal here. Like I, I would love to stay here for, for the long haul, but definitely the goal is to just can continue growing and, and help, you know, more and more users in any way that we can. Yeah. I want to add a small, uh, another small question. So besides obviously the main purpose and mission of Noviland with helping with end to end supplying, um, or sourcing, uh, how else are you helping uh, sellers besides that, uh, in terms of, um, your community approach or education, or I'm um, basically hinting for your show. So go ahead. I know. I love the plug. Thank you so much. Um, so Francois and I publish a uh, podcast. It's called Link Up Leaders. And our, what our goal is just to link uh, e-commerce business owners and anybody who's curious about e-commerce or supply chain with leaders in both of those industries. So we've had incredible guests like you on the show. Um, we've also had Oh gosh, we've done so many now. How many names can I remember? Um, Carlos Alvarez. We've had Norm Farrar. Um, we've had the guys from Firing the Man. Um, David and Ken, yeah. Yes, yes, David and Ken. Thank you. We've had uh, Dustin Kane and Chris Gramlich from two Amazon sellers and a microphone. Um, Chelsea Cohen from So Stocked. We've had Megala Bardwaj from India Sourcing Trip and um, Global Sources. She's incredible. We've had some folks from Seller App. I mean, really, we're just wanting to bring as much information and knowledge as possible about e-com and supply chain. It's very not salesy. We just want to be able to create kind of this knowledge base and this source of education for anybody who's wanting to start scale or even successfully exit their e-commerce business. Um, you know, we're hoping to have some guests on that work specifically in exits. And we had on a uh, Jake Barnett with Fortunet. He works along with Yael Kabili with Kabili and co, you know, so just from every part of it of like protecting your IP to selling your business to PPC, that's, that's really what the show is all about. And then also we just, we just have a ton of fun. I like to say, you know, it's, it's a podcast run by two millennials, like really anything. <laughs> and I think in our second episode with Tyler Scalzi, um, we talked about Tinder for like five minutes. It was like, that has nothing to do with e -com, but it's a good time. So it is, it's electric commerce when you want to basically have a partner or part, you know, a dating or, or, you know, hanging out, you go to your device, you pay money to this app yes. and then you, you purchase your, 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 um, human needs, right. Uh, which is interacting with others. Right. Uh, right. it could be a short-term thing or long-term thing. You know, I have a good friend that got married after that, you know, wherever they found on Tinder. So you never know. Right. Uh, so it is e-commerce in a different uh, domain that we usually take, um, uh, might think of, uh, or maybe even take for granted, but it definitely is e-commerce just, just right. FYI. <laughs> exactly. But, yeah. Um, very, very cool. So, um, I love that. That's what, what it's really all about that, that information flow and, and knowledge base is really what it's all about, uh, uh that sellers and, and entrepreneurs really need to keep on refining their game, refining their performance mm -hmm. and really succeeding with this uh, mission over time, because the terrain always changes. It's hyperdynamic. And having good sources that you know flow into you uh, and, and improve your knowledge 
that's awesome. Uh, so thank you for that and the show and having me there. I appreciate it. Um, all right. So I want to touch a little bit on your entrepreneur spirit. Uh, what do you kind of do on the side? I think that's unique. That's uh, unusual. So go ahead, share with us. Yeah. So I plan weddings on the side. Um, and that came from a history of just being, so I've been a bridesmaid six times and which is more than, uh, most women in general, especially most women who are only 26 and, uh, I'm not done. I do have more friends getting married. I love it. That's great. Yeah. Congratulations to everybody. You know, all your friends getting married. Nice. Yeah, absolutely. It's they've got, they've all been beautiful. They're such great people. Um, but anyway, I'm just, it, you know, by nature, I'm a very type a kind of person and I'm a very, you know, I need to know the details and I need to know, you know, where are we going? What time do we have to be there? How does you know, everybody need to be dressed? Does everybody have, you know, it's just very detail oriented. And that's what a lot of weddings is. And of the six times that I was a bridesmaid twice, I was a maid of honor. And there's just a lot of organization. There's a lot of party planning. I did uh, event planning when I was in college as well. So I kind of just decided at some point in time to, you know, make some money out of it instead of just helping even in the weddings where I wasn't a bridesmaid, I was still helping, you know, set up and tear down and cut cake and do all of this stuff at these weddings. And I was like, why don't I get paid to do this? Like, let's just, let's just put some money behind it. So, um, I ended up getting, um, a certified wedding and event planner, um, certification, I guess through, um, Kennesaw state university's extended Nice. That's, that's serious. You got a university to stamp uh, and certify you. That's, that's pretty G. That's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. I did. Uh, I did through their, um, continued education. That's what it is. So, um, so that the, some of the letters on the end of my thing. So CWP, um, but I, I just decided to go ahead and get certified. And then, uh, funny enough, I actually finished my certification in May of 2020. So that was a project that I had begun before the pandemic of getting my certification. And then of course, unemployment gave me plenty of opportunity to finish it out so that's what i kind did. of ironic because it's very hard to get married so once you're ready to you got your certificate are uh, you ready to, to explode uh you know weddings are kind of put on hold but all good things you know uh, it's going to come back uh, better than ever so you're always going to have the opportunity to develop there well, and that's, what's funny is I, you know, yes, like a lot of weddings were put on hold and a lot of folks who were supposed to get married in 2020 or even waiting until 2022, but I finished my certification in early May and I posted on Facebook that I'd gotten it. And my previous uh, manager at Brunswick zone, Jim Woodward, he actually knew somebody who was in need of a wedding planner. And so a week, two weeks later, got I got business right away. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, but they actually, they hired me in May and they were getting married in October. Mm -hmm. So I had about five months to plan this whole wedding and we had to replace the caterer three weeks before the wedding because the caterer had gone out of business because of COVID. Oh, wow. And I had to replace the DJ three days before the wedding because the DJ got COVID. So there was a lot of hoops to jump through, a lot of problem solving, a lot of putting out fires, like you said. And Francois, thank you for being tolerant of all of my midday phone calls during that time. <laughs> that's, that's pretty pretty amazing because you're being baptized on the fire. And uh, if you made it and did it in the COVID days, you're going to make it uh, anywhere. You know, it's the, paraphrasing for the New York, uh, make it there, make it anywhere. So if you made it as a wedding planner in COVID, you're going to make it uh anywhere at any time so uh, kudos for that all right so i just want to kind of uh, tie things together because i think it's very interesting uh, on your personality level so you're highly structured the thing for you is to be very, very structured and you know visibility on anything so pay, paying attention to all the details it just makes it a good experience for for whatever is needed right so you're doing it uh, as an entrepreneur on the wedding level but um for for, for uh, sellers every time they source that's a whole event on its own it needs to be very very structured and a lot of attention into detail so I think your, your, your spirit is kind of embodying uh, Novi Line's mission as well. It's all about structure. It's reliable because every time you source, that's an event. And it, it's, it triggers a whole chain of events that uh, need, needs careful attention uh, to, to make sure that the experience is great and good uh, and the, the, the event is successful. So it's interesting to tie that together. Okay, so now I want to uh, package the episode a little bit, see what we got as a recap, and then uh, you know head off to the final stage of uh, two points. Okay. So um, let's see what we got so far. So born and raised in Woodstock, uh, Georgia, right? My parents originally from Ohio. Um, you grew up there. 2012, you graduated uh, out of high school and you went to uh, college about four, four and a half years. And then 2016, when you graduate, um, uh, a friend of yours, uh, we gave you the opportunity to go into uh, a company that deals with um, information about people, uh, you know, background checks and uh, credit records and stuff like that. You did it for about, um, uh, yeah, four years until the pandemic hit, March of uh, 2020. And then, um, you know, you had to kind of pivot quickly and f reinvent yourself. And actually, you found yourself entering a new industry, which is the industry of e-commerce. So uh, you found Noviland, 
with the Novi Land in less than a year. Uh, you understand really what are the pain points and the needs and the mission and purpose and value of Novi Land. Uh, and, and Novi Land, I assume, did grow because there's a need for that. And the whole industry is growing. Um, in addition to all that, you, uh, you and Francois um, actually, uh, beyond the, the core mission, create another mission where you create a knowledge base with the podcast, with the show to help educate the sellers and make sure that they get more transparency of the visibility of other things that are not immediately related to Novi Land's mission. So that's basically, that's the beyond effect that you guys are trying to accomplish there. Um, did I get it so far? Is that the right packaging? 100%, yes. <laughs> Got it, very, very cool. So thank you for that and thank you for sharing. All right, so let's touch the last two points, right? So uh, the first thing will be is um, if somebody wants to connect and uh, learn more about you, where can they find you? Is it, give them a handoff. And the last thing will be is what is your message of hope and inspiration for entrepreneurs listening out there? Yeah, absolutely. So if anybody has any questions for me, you can always email me directly at lisa at novilane.com. Um, I'm also always, always, always on LinkedIn. So you can find me there. It's Lisa Kinsky, K-I-N-S-K-E-Y. Um, and then if you guys want to check out the show, it's called Link Up Leaders. We have a Facebook, a LinkedIn, YouTube channel. We have all of those three as, oh, and an Instagram. Um, pretty much all the social, we have that for Novilane and for uh, Link Up Leaders as well. So definitely, um, like share, subscribe, ring the bell for notifications, all that good stuff. Um, and then, yeah, as far as any, you know, hope or inspiration for, for entrepreneurs, I, I don't know if it's necessarily hope or inspiration, but maybe just a piece of advice. Uh, no time is ever going to feel right. You are never going to be ready. So do it now. Like now today is the day there's no better day, you know, no time like the present, I think is the saying, mm -hmm. not all of your ducks are going to be a hundred percent in a row. And as type A as I am, and I like to think that I can control everything like that. It's, it's not true. Something is going to go a little awry, or you're going to maybe not be a hundred percent ready to go, but it's better. I heard something on a podcast one time and it escapes me now, but it was, um, I think it was Cher Jones. And she said, uh, done is never perfect and perfect is never done. So like that. start now. If you've been thinking about it, just do it. Here's your sign. Do it. <laughs> oh, love it. Just do it. Uh, a, a big company also used that phrase, but uh, we're going to borrow for, for the moment and no better time than now. Just, so just do it. Great. Lisa, thank you so much for sharing. Uh, it was fascinating. I hope everybody else enjoyed and learned something new. Uh, stay safe and healthy, everybody. Until next time. Yeah. Thanks, Yoni. Bye everybody. Bye.